keeper. Tools up for three. Boom! Knocks it down. Curry from the corner at three. Puts it in. For overtime. Makes it. Garrett. Right. Welcome to the MVP cast from me, Mark Woods. Thank you, as always, for making space in your schedule to join us for some basketball conversation. Don't forget, you can stay in the loop with us on social media. Just search on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook for the MVP cast. Now, our guest on this edition is a man. I'm going to put it out there. I think he's playing in the wrong city. I mean, bear with me on this, right? He was in Newcastle. Now he's in Sheffield, but we all know where he should be. Rodney Glasgow Jr., welcome to the MVP cast. <laughs> appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And, and the burning question I've always wanted to ask you, have you ever been approached, well, I mean, we, we don't call them Glasgow anymore, but have you ever been approached to play for the franchise formerly known as the Glasgow Rocks? Uh, no, no, I haven't. I haven't formally uh, been approached by it, Gareth. <laughs> is that a dream before the end of your career to be a Glasgow playing in Glasgow? Uh, I don't really see it in the car for me but you know you never say never um you know what i mean it is what it is <laughs> it's not as much fun now they call caledonia it doesn't really work yeah, yeah um, that no, doesn't work anymore <laughs> <laughs> um we're just a couple of weeks away from a big big day in your life and you turn the big 3-0 i, I don't know if yeah. that's painful bringing it up but you know it's it's a, <laughs> it's, it's a milestone you know we yeah. survived this long um what did it mean to you? I mean, what 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 did what did this sort of occasion kind of take on a significance, if anything? Uh, I mean, a lot of things. Um, like first off, I mean, turning thirty in a whole different country, and then we had a game that day. There was just a lot going on that day. Um, but just the amount of love um, I got from a lot of people that I didn't expect to um, just meant a lot um, in terms of where I come from. Uh, my background, uh, for me to make it to 30 with no trouble, um, no, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in jail. I'm not, I'm not out here doing illegal activities. I'm out here doing, um, I'm out here doing the right thing and representing myself and my family the right way. And I'm representing the sharks the right way. So for me to be doing that at age 30, uh, living the life I want to live and playing the game I love to play, uh, getting paid to to do what I love it's a it's a milestone and a, an accomplishment in in itself um and then uh just uh I would say just also just turning 30 you just realize how much mature you have come over the years um you appreciate it and you continue to be like how can I be better and I think that's where I'm at right now is just how can I better myself on and off the court and stuff so yeah I mean, it's probably a cultural difference between the yeah. States and here. When you're saying, yeah. I'm glad I'm not in jail or yeah. doing bad stuff. I mean, does that yeah. imply that you know, there was there was chances, there was forks in the road for you, there was you know others that you were with, and that, that is a position you could have been in? Yeah, I mean, 100%. Um, you know, the States and here are much different. Um, you know what I mean? I think, uh, I personally think, uh, you know, maybe if I stayed where I was at, I wouldn't have grown. I wouldn't have evolved as a man, as a black man. Um, and I could have been in trouble. I could have, I could have got, got myself into trouble. Um, you know what I mean? Just either being at the wrong place, wrong time or being influenced by the wrong people. Um, and all the obstacles that you're given, uh, living in America, um, to start with, it doesn't, you know, it's not, it's not to your advantage versus I think here. So, like I said, like for me to be 30 years old and, you know, do a lot of things already and a, and a lot of good things and try to continue to do a lot of good things and where I'm at in my life personally, um, you know, I'm, I'm very much thankful and grateful that it didn't go that way. Like, you know what I mean? Because a lot of a lot of kids or a lot of men who look like me, it, it usually in the percentages usually does go that way um, just because of a lot of things, you know. So I'm just happy I could be the one that, made it out and especially for my family that I was the one that can be you know a, a image and model for my family of you know try to succeed and do things the right way where did you, you know, where did you find that I guess that inspiration that guidance to 
steer you in a path that's you know it's enabled you to explore the world and do different things rather than going down that more negative or you know more doomsday route um i think uh with anybody with any kid coming up uh it doesn't matter the race or the color but i always think it always starts at home um you know i've uh i've had two really good parents and my mother and father um i'm a junior obviously so um my dad uh, instilled a lot of discipline in me, um, taught me to be respectful, taught me the importance of working hard and being honest and being a man of your word. Um, and then on the flip side of my mother, she um, taught me the things of sacrifice and love and uh, how to respect others, uh, respect how you want to be respected um, and about family. So um, there was times when, you know, if, uh, certain friends I had at a certain point in life, they was doing something bad. Um, I wasn't allowed to do that. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't going out with them and all that stuff to do that. Um, and then um, also picking your right friends, picking the right people around you. Um, I went to private school and stuff, so um, you know, I was I was around also good people that was also doing the right things. Um, and I think if you associate yourself like that, um, you at least give yourself less trouble. Uh, and to get into trouble if that makes sense <laughs> do you think i mean we're we're talking now and i know you you just before this you were coaching kids yeah. and there's that great thing about the the positive influence that athletes can have especially in kids because you know you can cut through in ways that maybe a parent or maybe a teacher can't always do but are you able to i know mean, it's a different it's the other side of the atlantic and it's you know it's sheffield rather than baltimore or brooklyn or are you able to kind of bring that experience to to bear on some of these kids that you know you're nominally you're coaching basketball but you know a lot of this is the bigger picture it's about lives and making them better you better prepared for think, life yeah yeah 100 percent. i think uh i think you know we live in a day and age now where athletes aren't athletes are just athletes anymore and a lot of these kids do look up to us and we have a responsibility to teach them to educate them to to uh you know um tell them you know what's right and what's wrong and how did how did we come up and persevere so that in whatever they want to do because it's not about them playing basketball like us or whatever sport it is it's about them choosing what they want to do in life and then uh working hard for that um and i think if kids hear that from us and our voice and we continue to do that i think it, it, it's a positive outlook and for me personally i just love being with kids um you know what i mean kids are innocent you know, kids kids uh, learn a lot at a very young age, and uh, you you want to you want to put that information into them at a young age so that by the time they get to high school and stuff like that, they are on a good path. Um, then more than others, um, you know what I mean. So it's, it's important, and especially especially if I'm in another country, I can you know I can tell them how it is in one area in, in America versus how it's here. Um, and, you know, they can really, you know, get, get the word that I'm trying to get through to them and stuff. So it's good. It was the thing you wrote on, on social. Um, and it kind of, I guess, fits with this. I know, but I find it intriguing the way you put it. You said, you know, as, as black people, we have to do better for our community. We have to hold ourselves to a certain standard and have that ownership to make the change for our children. I mean, is that is that a sense of responsibility that that comes from your parents, or does that come from the environment, or you know, where do you, where is that feeling that that you've had instilled, or that's grown in you that you you need to be one of those people setting the example? Um, one, it definitely comes from my parents because uh, you was you know we live in different generations now. Um, with, with, with my generation, with my parents' generation, and, and, and now these kids. Um, but, you know, I was always taught community. Um, I was always taught to, even if it wasn't your family, relatively speaking, you know, if there's someone in your community, it's, 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 it's your personal responsibility to look out for them. Um, you know what I mean? So when I when I tweeted that, um, I just, I was, it was off of the news I was reading uh, recently. Um, just about uh, what's going on uh, in sports culture, music culture, and 
I felt sad uh, just because I, I was saying that I think we as a people, as black people, we need to do better in holding ourselves accountable and looking out for each other. And I felt like we recently as community all together have lost sense of that, uh, which I don't know why. But, you know, what I was trying to say was you see it in, in all communities um, of how they support each other. And I think we should learn from that and do a better job in that and stuff. Um, and that's where it comes from. That you know, from just assessing it, also my family, and then also seeing like how can I be better in that as well. You know what I mean? Um, these things are, are important and stuff because if we are doing better, then we are less in trouble um, and stuff like that. And in the states, um, the way the laws are, it's not really made in our favor. So I, that's what I that's what I mean about holding hold, holding each other accountable, and making sure that we don't you know do anything stupid and we represent ourselves a certain way that we should be because, you know, um, we, we're going to be looked at no matter what. So we have to make sure that we um, are doing things the right way. Did you find when you came to Europe and you, yeah, you've, you, you've not just been in the UK. I mean, you, you went to Switzerland first and Slovakia and yeah. Belgium and then yeah. and you had a spell in Iceland in between your, your stints with Newcastle and Sheffield. What, yeah. Was there, and it, you know, there's always a sort of, I guess feeling of superiority in Europe across you know, over the US, which I find it a nonsense because there's great things about both sides of the Atlantic, and there's things which aren't so good. But did, did you did you find ways? I'm not saying every way, but was there ways when you came to Europe that you felt more comfortable or felt more at ease than you might have done back at home? Yeah, hundred um, percent. Yeah, it's any uh, you know, athlete best athlete that looks like me. Um, you just feel safe out here. Uh, not a lot of not a lot of issues that you have going going back home that you have when you're out here in Europe. Um, like for example, um, obviously like police here in the UK don't carry guns. Um, you know what I mean? So that right there just is one thing that is different just from here in this country than in the states. Um, I even think the way the school the schools are here are much better protected than in the states. Because obviously you've seen so many school shootings back home in America, and you don't hear that here. Um, you know what I'm saying? And you shouldn't hear that. Our, you know, our kids should be kids. Kids and parents should feel safe when they bring when they take their kid to school, uh, and vice versa. Um, and then um, the most thing I've seen in Europe is something I've been talking about is community. I've seen I've been in a lot of countries where, um, you know. Let's say they respect the country, people really look out for each other and really all about being together and family and stuff like that. And that's the biggest thing I took away, the difference of being in Europe or even being here than uh, in the States. You know, sometimes in the States, it's a lot of, it's usually about a lot of money and stuff. And it's not like that in other states. And I mean, in a, sorry, in a, other countries, it's about how can we be better as a community and get better. And I think if we take that, we should be good. Is there ways to know that not everything's you know peaches and cream? Yeah. Um, no, no, no. What is there things here that you that make you feel uncomfortable, or where you think I'd like to be more comfortable in that situation? Um, you mean like when I'm in Europe, or yeah, or even know? specifically the UK? Um, I mean, there's time. I mean, you know, it's, like there's racism everywhere, um, but. Um, I mean, there have been times, you know, where let's say, uh, let's say, you know, you walk into certain places and maybe you can feel that, you know, you're not welcome. Um, you know what I mean? Something like that is it's, it's, it's definitely here, but it's not, it's not like, it's not as scripted as it is that phone and stuff like that. And that's the point I'm trying to make. Like, uh, you know, me being here in Sheffield, um, you know what I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a mixed multicultural area and I feel comfortable where I'm at, you know, I can be around anybody and be myself and stuff like that. And that's what, I, and that's my whole thing. Like, uh, it shouldn't matter what, what color you are. We should all be, you know, all for each other, one for each other and all that stuff. And it's not like that back home per se. Um, there's, you know, in some areas, now luckily in the States where I live, it is kind of like that. It's very multicultural and, you know, all kinds of nationalities and stuff. But um, if you're in some places in America, you know, it's, it's, it's tricky. You know what I mean? It's tricky and it is what it is. So you got to kind of just be like, how can I make sure that I'm safe? And I think that's the biggest thing. Like when I'm here, I feel safe. I can be with anybody and be good. 
aside from those more you know, societal things um yeah. of the four countries that you've been in in europe and you had must come to that it's five um where has been the most intriguing to adapt to and where was the easiest uh hardest adapt to um was uh i had to actually play in china for like a couple of weeks mm. um yeah 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 um and uh that was that was a definitely that was a real adjustment obviously obviously because the time difference the language barrier um obviously they have different you know even their bathrooms are different uh the way they eat and live is different um so i remember i remember just being in china i lost so much weight because um <laughs> I lost so much weight because you know, obviously I'm not I'm not I'm not used to the food there, and they the way that, the way they would start their day is they would drink they would just drink tea in the morning to flush out the body, and they would you can only have maybe like one big meal or something like that. It was you know, and you had to adjust to that and respect their culture because you're living in that country. And for me, it was a it was an adjustment, but I loved every minute of it just because you know I'm learning from other cultures you know what I mean and I, and, and I think that's the, that's the most thing I love I, I love that I that I'm able to love from other cultures because of basketball you know what I mean it's uh, it's afforded me a good life uh, to do that and the easiest probably for me is I would I would have to say here <laughs> you know what I mean yeah, I mean me living here in the UK it's just easy to adjust to the same language um it's a very there's some some things that are Americanized uh, people here are nice and stuff. You listen, you hear the same music. There's a lot of spots here, so yeah. When you um, you were kind of a child of two cities in a sense, or two places in the states. Which you know, you're born in Brooklyn, and you know, you grew up there a little bit. Then the family moved to Maryland, which is near Washington D.C., and you know, Baltimore yeah. is the big city there. And you know, I suppose you've what what in what's the different influences there? Because you know, they're both. They're both big metropolises, and you know they're both places yeah. that you know with that have a have a certain reputation. But you know how how have each of those two places shaped you as a player um, and, a, and as a person? That's a really good question. Um, as a as a as a player, um, you know, being in New York, uh, growing up there, you know, you, you learn a lot of ball handling. Uh, learn how to be shifty. You learn how to, you know, have a lot of ooh and oohs and ahs moments because that's what New York is about. Um, I used to, my dad used to take me to the park all the time. Uh, he used to take me to Kingston Park, which is like in Brooklyn. Um, we used, I used to play there. I used to play, I used to play all, I used to play up. So I used to play as a grown man and stuff. And it, it teaches you to be tougher um, and build that mentality. So I would say, like, as a player, it helped me bring my ball handling, being physical, um, kind of having that gritty mentality. And then when I went and played in Maryland, uh, it's kind of the same. I played in – I am I grew up in PG County, which is like – which is a known area uh, if, you, if you're a basketball player there where all the hoopers are there. And it's right next to Washington, D.C. And there you just see how, uh, the, like, most of the players are coachable, very skilled. They can do it all, um, play really good defense, you know, play the right way. Um, but, they, but they're efficient usually. Uh, within there, so I learned how to be efficient while I, you know, uh, grew up playing there and playing for those top programs in Maryland. And then as a person, um, you know, it just shapes you a different way. Like you know, um, you could be going to a private school, but most of the guys who got recruited, you know, we all come from, you know, tough areas and stuff. So it shapes you that way. Um, it shapes you to have a certain swag, a certain style. Uh, in some areas so like I always get the impression I always get asked like you know you play like you you play like you either from New York or from PG County and I think it's a sign of respect because it, it's it's usually respected um, all across the world and definitely all across America if, if you play there I've been to some of those parks in New York and it's fascinating when you, you can rock up in days and there might be five guys there there might be 50 guys and it's but it's intense yeah. and it's competition yeah. and it's you know yeah. winner come off that kind of thing um, but yeah. you know there's a lot of guys go there in the summer and you spent your summers there and um, who's the yeah. best guy that you end up finding yourself sharing a court with oh man Ooh, that's a tough question because uh, you know, every summer I'm going up against like I usually work out with you know Euroleague guys and NBA guys um, so man toughest toughest guy that I went up against has to be a guard named Bryce Cotton who plays in uh, Australia right now. 
Um, but he played for Providence for a while. He was in the, he was in the NBA for a while. Um, he was a really good guard, dynamic guard. Had a real East Coast game. He was very explosive. And then I would have to say he's my best friend, actually, but um, Eric Green, um, who played for Virginia Tech. And uh, he definitely one of the best scorers I ever went up against. And, uh, you know, uh, he can just score in so many ways and be a professional sh- uh, shot maker where he can play your best defense and he still, you know, scores on you with ease. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, those probably be the two most most time I ever been around was Kevin Durant. Uh, to be honest, when I was like 21 years old, um, he came in a workout one time, and this is when he's playing with Oklahoma City Thunder, and you can just see how he's just a superstar. Like his work ethic was crazy. Um, the things that he was doing, the way that he was scoring, it was just it was like you was you were just in awe. You were sitting there in awe sometimes, even though like you were on the same court with him. But you're just sitting there like this is, you know, I can't believe this is this is going on right now. You know, he's scoring thirty, he's scoring thirty every game, basically. <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, it's it's good to be around that environment. It's good to be around uh, because because it makes you better. One, but two, it just builds that energy and, and and confidence in you that if I can play with them, I can play with anybody. When you say you mean you work out with some NBA guys in the summer, I mean, is that is that useful to kind of shop on yourself? You know, because you know these guys that you know they're the best of the best, but they get you know they get generally they've got good habits and good skills. I mean, does that in that small window each year kind of just help you refresh yourself? Yeah, it's a it's a breath of fresh air. Um, I have a trainer that obviously he holds workouts and and holds uh, you know five on five open gym and stuff. But for me personally, it's just to see like where I'm at. You know what I mean? And, I always say this, if you can if you can hold your own with that, then you can hold your own with anybody. And like I said, like, they're in the NBA, so, you know, obviously they're getting paid millions and stuff. They're going to be looked to be better than you in a way. But that doesn't take away of you holding your own and you being competitive. Um, and you've seen how you can, get, you can get better, you know what I mean? And I think going into my workouts every summer, that's how I'm going now. You know, I don't. I don't look at it like a wild moment. I look at it like, okay, they're in the NBA, but so what? You know what I mean? I play, I play professionally too, and I can play with the best of them, and I know where I come from. And I have that mentality, you know, no matter who I go up against. And I, and I think that's what is the most important thing. I think just the mentality when you go up against these guys. Your college experience is is quite different to a lot of players. In fact, most players, because you know you you. You dropped a couple of names of colleges in there, friends that they play at. You went to a place, and too far, until I looked up Wikipedia yesterday, I'd never heard of it. The Virginia yeah, yeah. Military Institute. I know it's. I'm. I'm going to read out their website. Is it describes it as you know a, a sort of version of West Point, which is the big military college. But here, this is this is what it's telling me. And again, it, this comes from Wikipedia, but it's probably true. It includes the alumni, not only yourself. A U.S. Secretary of State, a Secretary of Defense, a Secretary of the Army, a Nobel Peace Prize winner, 13 Rhodes Scholars, a Pulitzer Prize winner, an Academy Award winner, an Emmy Award winner, and a Golden Globe winner, and a martyr. I don't know who the martyr yeah. was, but that's a nice one to throw at the end. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, this place, I mean, it, it's, you know, it, it's a military academy. It's a military university in a sense. Um but I was I did a bit of digging on this, yeah. You know, and th- this is some of the things we're saying here is that you know the ca- your cadets, you're not students, you cadets. You have to live yeah. in a barracks, so it's it's proper military. And yeah. <laughs> this place sounds crazy. What on earth took you there? Uh, to be honest, I, I, I still ask myself now how did I get to, how did I go to that place? But um, at the time of recruiting. Um, my coach, he's not, he's, he's not, he's not the head coach there anymore. But when he was the coach at the end, my coach, uh, Coach Bachman, um, he was, you know, recruiting me hard. And um, the way they played, you know, they played up tempo, fast, and kind of played like Golden State Warriors uh, do now. And that was the first thing that attracted me. Um, they led the, they led the NCAA in, uh, in scoring, and uh, it was a free throw offense, and I loved it. Like you know what I mean? It just, it just fit me. And then. Um, I remember one of my uh, high school coaches, who uh, also was my trainer, Mike Glasby. He uh, 
he had a uh, Georgetown coach call me who he was close with, uh, John Thompson III. And um, because I wasn't going to go there, I, like like you said, it was crazy and all that stuff. Like, I'm like, I'm not going to the school. <laughs> you know what I mean? But uh, he had John Thompson III call me and he spoke to me for like 10 minutes and kind of convinced me on why I should go there. And the reasons he was saying it was not, you know, the military. It was about basketball related. And then the things I can do off the court, you know, if I'm able to go to this, uh, go to this institution and do what I'm do what I'm supposed to do. And I looked at it that way. So I went on my visit, and it was the best. It was, it was one of the best visits I've been on. You know what I mean? Um, everything was like real cool. The coaches was all warm. The atmosphere, the people there was nice. Um, and then like when I sat down with coach, he just was like, look, you know, I know it's a military school, but you know, if, if you go here, you don't have the commission if you don't want to. And usually that's not, usually that, that, that doesn't happen. So the fact that I didn't have the commission was a, was a, was a plus. And when I told him I wanted to play professionally, uh, my coach had a track record of having a lot of pros that, you know, that either play in the NBA or go overseas. So that was like the two things that convinced me and it was close to home and I wanted my family to still come to my games. Um, so it was an easy one and that's the decision I made. I mean, I started off four years, had a great career and, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I don't regret it. What was the toughest? Because I'm sure you weren't allowed to get away with doing none of this side of stuff. What, what was the toughest add-on that you had from the military quote-unquote side? Um... You got to be disciplined before I even answer the question to go to military school. So, <laughs> um, because you know you can, you're not disciplined, and you know you you're regular college because you're you're just gonna get in trouble. It is what it is. But um, like for example, a day is a uh, a regular day is you gotta wake up seven in the morning for breakfast formation. Um, they put you in a company, so I was in Charlie Company. Um, uh, your uniform had to be shined and cleaned <laughs> if not you they would give you points for it which is called a demerit um and then uh you got to march down for breakfast <laughs> 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 which is crazy to say but you had to do it <laughs> everyone everyone else did it and you had to act like a cadet and then you would go to your school i mean you you go to your classes and your room had to be tidied up because an officer can walk in and inspect your room that day um so and then you also had military training in whatever branch you was in. Uh, I was in Air Force at the time. Um, and then, uh, so you got all that, and then we had practice. We had, we had basketball. So we had, we, had, we had S&T, and then we had basketball practice. So that's a whole day. Your day gets done at 6 o'clock, and then you have dinner formation. <laughs> so you got breakfast formation, and you got dinner formation, which is at 7 as well. And you might be, you might be in a different outfit, and you got to march down again. So all that is a whole day of down being on your legs, doing all that, going to class, and then you still got to do your homework and stuff. So <laughs> that's a, that's already just a day in itself. Um, on the weekends, if you wanted to go out, you had to you had to do you had to sign out. So every person had their own ID and password. But if you you have to sign out and put you know a weekend or put something in there, and then you have to sign back in. And be back on Sunday at a curfew, which is at eleven thirty. <laughs> and you wouldn't have got that at Georgetown. No, I wouldn't have to do all any of that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So um, does, it goes does, to show you just the commitment. Does does that sort of? I mean, I mean, do, again, you sort of talk about discipline in life and the lessons that you learn, and yeah, now you've turned thirty. I mean, what did you really take away from that environment? Because you know, it's it it's kind of i'm sure a kind of curious mix at times military and basketball but how did right. how did that shape you again as as this grown person that you've become um it just wanted um i mean discipline for one i mean uh two it, it taught me personal responsibility because uh um even when even in college you know um you actually do a lot uh, coach expects a lot out of you, and then you have a military thing, so you have to answer the officers as well. You know, yes sir, no sir. You have to stand in, the, you have to stand a certain way when the officer walks in a 
walks in a room or you walk into their room uh, or, or office. So it teaches you um, discipline, respect, and time management as well. It teaches you how to juggle all these things um, and then still being able to do your job. And I think as a professional athlete, we get, we're we given a lot to do and then we still got to go and do our job and stuff. And I think that was probably like, like the two biggest things and just being honest. Um, at my, at my, uh, at my institution, um, you know, if you were caught lying, you can get kicked out of, of, of the college. Uh, seriously, if you didn't, if you didn't, even if you, you know, made a mistake or something happened, you have to go in and tell the officer what you did. Um, and then he would give you a punishment and then that was it. Um, so if you didn't do that, which I saw a lot of times guys would get kicked out, whether it was, you know, cheating on a test, a paper, anything like that, missing curfew for whatever reason, all that stuff, um, you know, you you have to go in and tell on yourself. And it was it was it was it was basically a way of making sure being a man of your word and being responsible enough to be like, you know, if I, if I made a mistake, I got to be man enough to man up to it. Um, so those are the things I think over the years overseas that it's, it's, it's brought me to to where, you know, I can be by myself and carry myself and take care of myself and make sure that I conduct myself in a certain way. Does that give you, I guess, leadership skills that really translate directly into the position you play as a point guard? Uh, you know, probably if you look at, I mean, looking into it because point guards are usually an extension of the coach. Mm. Um, they're looked on as to lead and tell guys where to go, what to do. Um, usually, if the point guard is not, if the point guard is not all the way locked in, and and they're not they're not being all about not just themselves but just the team. You got to be about the team if you're a point guard, um, and what's better for the team. Um, then it's, it's usually not going to go. It's, it's, it's not going to go well, um, you know. And and your coach has to trust you. You know what I mean. Your coach is basically like your general, you know what I mean. Or he's your he's your you know he's your he's your officer, and you, and, and you have to you have to lead these guys. And make sure that they buy into whatever the mission is, and I think that's 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 that ties into the military school, hundred percent. With I mean, with those sort of skills and that, I guess that self awareness. How do you keep growing and how do you keep developing that now? Um, I just think as a human, you can never not stop growing. Like, there's always something that you can get better at. We are all not perfect people, you know what I mean? So who am I to say, yeah, I'm good. I got all this now. I don't I don't need anything help. I got everything. And I just don't think that's not true. I think, I think you always have to better yourself and challenge yourself and see what you can do better for yourself, which is also better for, in my case, better for the team or better for your family. You know what I mean? There's, there's so much things that you have to look at and, and and question yourself on what are the things that I'm doing that can that can better any situation. Um, so that's how I look at it. Um, even you know, from if you look at it from basketball, no basketball player is great at everything. So you might as well work on everything because you're not going to be, you know, you're not you're not you're not you know. For example, Steph Curry's the best three point shooter, but you know Steph Curry isn't the most explosive person. But he works on getting to the rim and being being efficient at his role. You know, what I mean, LeBron James is not the best uh, free throw shooter or three point shooter, but he's arguably one of the greatest players to play the game. And I think it's because they are, you know, they they they, they have core values that they that they work on and that and, 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 that, and that they work on to be better every single day. And I think that's what you have to do. Do you read? I mean, some. I know you read a lot. I mean, is that part of that developing that? self-awareness or even just awareness of this environment in which you inhabit yeah i mean um i i started reading like you know uh in the last like two years because i really wanted to make sure that my mind and my mental was straight because i think basketball is way more mental than physical um and if your mental is not right you can't be good for yourself or anybody um and in the position that i'm in i never want to make sure that I'm not there. Like, I'm not mentally there. You know, if I'm not mentally there, um, you know, we can struggle as a team. You know what I mean? And, you know, I don't ever, you never want to be the cause of that. So I try to challenge my mind and make sure that I bring it to a, a more calm state and stuff and, and, and then, you know, put it to the guys when when needed. So that's what I'm saying. Like, there's so many ways that you have to challenge yourself that it's not just basketball. It's mental stuff. It's 
stuff that you could do as a person, as a man, and stuff like that that can that can that can bring it towards the court that I think should be implemented. What's the most insightful book that you've read? Because I've I've got on the shelf behind me hundreds of basketball books, and amongst those are the great guru books written by coaches. You know that, that translate it into you know to whether it's business or personal growth and all that. So there you know there is there's a lot of basketball focused elements to that 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 kind of section of your books bookstore but what book has stood out for you that's that's maybe inspired you or made you sit up and think uh definitely um i mean obviously you got you got your tim grover books who mm. obviously that was michael jordan's uh trainer um uh his book has been able to speak to me in the quotes that i've gotten from him um i'm reading now uh, the Alchemist, which is a very famous book and known book that a lot of people um, have read that I've just now read. Um, for myself, I've, I'm reading now this book called Just Black Privilege, um, which talks about just the importance of how important you can be for your people and how can you be of service to your community and stuff. So I try to tell all these things into what I try to be for myself, um, if that makes sense. Um, and I try to, you know, now days I try to read, try to read at least three to four books a year, um, just because, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I don't have a lot of time. So if I get three books in a year, then it's good. With um, with off the court, what else do you do to chill? Are you are you a music guy? Yeah, I love music. I think, uh, you know, a lot of guys don't tell you, but a lot of athletes, man, music music can get you through the day. You know, we we away from our loved ones, our families. Um, you know, nine to ten months out of the year, and sometimes you need, sometimes you need music. Sometimes, sometimes you need music to uh, get you through things. So um, I listen to all kinds of music now. I'm listening to jazz contemporaries now. Uh, obviously, I got Jay Z. I got Kanye West. I got um, I listen to Little Baby. Um, I listen to Meek Mill. I listen to Kendrick Lamar and J Cole. But well, actually, J Cole's one of my favorite favorite rappers. Um, and then I listen to a lot of R and B, truth be told, <laughs> nowadays. Um, I just like listening, and it's a nice music that, that that keeps me calm and stuff. And then when it's game time, I listen to that. So um, all those all those music though, I try to make sure that you know there's a message there. Nas is another one that I listen to. Um, so yeah, like all these all these all these musicians and artists that I listen to gets me through the day. Sometimes you know, it, it can be a long day, and when you get home, you just need some music to listen to. I'm not hearing any Sheffield artists in that or Yorkshire artists. Come on, you got to go local. I got, I got to get used to that one. <laughs> get, get some pulp on, or yeah, no, nah, I got to, that. I got. In Sheffield, they, you know, all I hear is I hear a lot of Sweet Caroline. <laughs> <laughs> Very authentic. <laughs> yeah, everyone, everyone knows that one. You know what I mean? But it's all good though. I got to I'm still getting used to the city, so give me. Give me, give me a couple more months, and then we can talk about it. <laughs> I mean, you you care a few months. You've got three years in this deal, which is you know is a is a great show of faith from the Sharks. I mean, I think it's a great sign in the league that these kind of deals are coming out there. And obviously, this season, the old man's retired. You're the new captain of the Sharks. Um, I mean, how how much of it? I mean, you know, a captain is captain. It's just a you know a C beside you in the team sheet. But you know, it, it can also be. A heavy duty role and what's what's the adjustment been for you from just being regular joe player to the captain of sheffield sharks i think uh when you're the captain and it's announcing um all that thing i think the number one thing is you have to keep the main thing the main thing and that's the team and that's making sure that uh we are here to do the job but we are also here to be brothers uh for that team um, so you know, obviously, you know, it comes with a lot of responsibility when you are the guy, like, you know what I mean? And for me, it's more so like, just never let it get to me to never, you know, don't let the name, um, of a, you know, or the, or the title be, be it to where it get it, it, it goes to your ego and stuff. I don't want to be that guy. I want to make sure that I leave by the right way and that I be vocal the right way. And I know, I, you know, I know it, um, it is my team, but, you know, you need other leaders as well. You need you need to instill leadership in other people and stuff because you can't just be the, the, the only leader. You have to instill in others. And that's what I try to do with our team now. Um, 
and you also got to be responsible because eyes are on you. Uh, a lot of the times, you know, you have to make sure that, like I said, you represent yourself a certain way because not only am I representing myself, but now I'm representing an organization. And um, they are still trusting me with Sarah, the Tiva, and Yuri. So, you know, you never want to mess that trust up because they're giving so much trust in you. So I just, I, all these factors are, 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 are going into this, you know, when they when they gave me my deal and, and, and appointed me captain, you know, there's reasons for that. So you never want to let them down. You never want to let the people down. And also Tuck, um, Tuck, Tuck groomed me. He is a big, a, a, a big friend of mine. Um, and he given me, and he has given me information and advice that I've needed uh, going forward as a captain. And I think you need that. You need you need older people to 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 give you the right information and stuff like that, so that you don't you don't make no mistakes and you can do you can try to do a better job than they did and and succeed them. So it, it's it's it, it it all speaks into that. You know what I mean? So yeah. I mean, it's been an okay start, but the one result within this first part of the season is is the result that everyone I guess sat up and took notice of when you guys became the team that guaranteed that London Lions will not go however many games you play this season undefeated in the BBL yeah. Championship um, right. I mean it's kind of one of those scenarios where we thought it'll happen you know when they come yeah. back off a European game it'll be a road game on a Friday night um, yeah. but did you guys surprise yourself a little bit that night with being, you know, because, you know, we know the money, we know the budget, the yeah. players. I mean, what what was the vibe when you walked off the court? Um, well, uh, to, before answering that question, um, it's been an okay start for us. Uh, you know, obviously I was injured, um, so it kind of kind of messed up a lot mm -hmm. of our chemistry and stuff like that. And I think now you're seeing uh, the team that Atiba and Sarah signed, and how it's all coming together, and we just got to keep getting better and stuff. Now, to answer your question, though, um, no, because um, we, us, us playing in Portugal in that tournament, we was playing against, you know, teams like London's Caliber. So, you know, we was already getting used to playing that, that level. And, you know, I mean it when I say this, I think we could beat anybody in the league. Um, you know what I mean? This league is much tougher now, and anybody can be beaten. And, you know, London is isn't, isn't, isn't separated from that because of the money and the players that they have, you know, anybody can be beaten. So, um, we knew going in, you know, just play with confidence, play with energy. Um, we knew that they would, obviously we all know that, 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 that they'll be tired, um, and all that stuff and our energy and us playing with a certain kind of swagger and together, which is what we've, we've been doing much, much better now, um, has been showing. And I think that's why we won the game. When we won the game, um, we, we, I mean, we was excited, you know, of course, of course you're excited you know, to get the win and all that stuff. But, you know, people got to understand we had a game on Sunday. We had Leicester on Sunday. So we couldn't really have too much time to celebrate and, you know, being all and all that stuff, you know, because we were playing another good team. So we just kept it as business as usual. Um, you know what I mean? But going forward, I mean, obviously they're a great team. I mean, they got they got all the guys that you need. And obviously for the money that they got, you should have all the guys for that. So, you know what I mean? Um, credit to us for, for winning that. And we know, and we know next time that, that we play them, it's going to be a tough game. You know what I mean? It's not going to be like that just because we know that we're the first team to beat them. So obviously they're going to feel a certain way about it. Yeah. We have to, we got to be ready for that. I'm sure the rest of the league were quite happy as well. Yeah. Quite, I'm sure you know, most, I'm quite sure quite most of the league happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, talk about celebrating. Let's, let's finish you off here. Um, we never really asked. How did you celebrate the 3 0? Oh, um, I just, you know, I'm, I'm a real, like, low-key guy, but, um, you know, after the game, I was in Newcastle. I was just with my teammates uh, and loved ones, and um, uh, we, uh, like, we went out, we went out, had a couple drinks, um, and celebrated that way. Uh, had a big cake, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, you know, like, basically, that had, 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 had some music and stuff like that. Nothing, nothing crazy. Um, just because, like, that, that week we had London and Leicester, so you can't really do too much that week. Um, but uh, it was still good, you know what I mean? And that's the whole thing. Like, I'm not a – usually for me, I'm, not, I'm a, I'm a low-maintenance person, so if I, get a, if I get a happy birthday from anybody, you know, that, that, makes, that, that makes it, like, the most, like, memorable thing for me. Um, but to have 
at the game, you got all the fans coming to you, telling you happy birthday. I had, I even had um, Darius. He came and said happy birthday to me. Some of the guys from the Eagles um, that came and said happy birthday to me, you know. And I thought that was touching, uh, just because like I love them guys still, um, you know what I mean. And then, uh, and then when you got your own teammates and your own organization uh, wishing happy birthday, and you got fans giving you gifts and stuff, it was just very overwhelming, but in a good way, not 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 in a bad way. So not not that being a kid is over. You know, what what what's next? What have you thought about? What do you want to achieve from the rest of your life now? What's the biggest goal? Um, I would say, uh, oh man, there's a lot. I mean, you mean basketball or just in life? Life, life, oh, life, life. Um, you know, I do. You know, I want to. I do. I do want to settle down soon. <laughs> um, that would be nice. I, you know, to go go that way. Um, I would like to, I would like to, um, have a place here in, in the UK and go back and forth. Um, I would like to, at one point, at some point, uh, either part own or own a BBL team. Um, I, um, and really, uh, you know, really make sure that like we keep basketball in this, in this, in this country and, um, and keep it, keep it going the way, the way it's been going. Um, and I want to, you know, find ways to own things and help kids and communities um, that really need the help, um, that really need the resources. Um, I think those things are important. Um, and, you know, uh, as far as basketball wise, man, just try to, you know, try to get more championships. Uh, if personal accolades come, great. I just want to be respected as a basketball player with, with who. Who could, who's, who's a good player and a and a and a good dude and a, and a and a good leader to good leader to his community and, and to his people and to his teammates and to his organization. I think that that's that's what matters to me the most. And they do say that point guards improve with age, so you know you've you've got a while yet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you know, I got a I got a chip under me, but I was with that was with that was with the Eagles. <laughs> um, so you know, you try to do it somewhere else. Um, Obviously, it's going to be harder now, obviously, with the level of talent here. you got the London Lions and Leicester and all these teams coming up, so it's going to be harder. But, yeah, you know, th- th- those are the things I want personally. And, um, yeah, hopefully just, you know, settle down eventually, have a family, all that stuff. There you go, ladies, ladies, if you're listening, here he is. Come get nah, him. man. <laughs> 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 Roddy, it's it's been a pleasure having you on. Um, continued success this season, and um, yeah, keep doing great things on and off the court. All right, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate this uh, this interview, man. Um, anytime I, I I get asked to do an interview, I appreciate it because you know you guys are not going to ask just anybody. You know what I mean? So I appreciate you guys, man. And Even though you got a name Glasgow, we'll still have you on. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, good talking to you. Thanks, man. That is it for this edition of the MVP cast. Don't forget, you can get all our previous editions at mvp247.com or via your preferred podcast provider. If you want to reach out to me, you can get me on Twitter at Mark Britball. Another edition of the podcast coming very soon. But for me, Mark Woods, thank you so much for your company and it's goodbye.